Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Please join me in the opening sentences. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. I'm glad that you have joined us for worship this first Sunday of November as we move into the fall and the weather turns cool outside. I'm glad that you have found space to worship together today. There are a couple of things that I'd like to draw to your attention before we begin worship this morning. First of all, if you could take a moment to locate and, register, and sign the Register of Friendship that you can find in the video description below or in the original email about worship you received, we would appreciate you taking a moment to fill out that Register of Friendship. That way we can know who has gathered um, all over the place to worship today. A couple of upcoming events. Next Saturday, this coming Saturday, November 7th, we're going to be providing lunch for the community table. This is something that we as a church do periodically. We will, we will be preparing bagged lunches for them to uh, coordinate with the restrictions that they have in place right now. Linda Anderson is going to be recorder, re, uh, coordinating this meal. She will need help on the day before, November 6th, to help make the sandwiches, and she'll also need help on November 7th to distribute them. There's also a list in the bulletin of the food that she will need to provide this meal. If you're able to provide any of that food, please take a look at that list and drop off some, some of that food at the church kitchen sometime in this coming week. Uh, do let us know when you bring that food by so that we can make sure someone will be here to receive that food. If you are not able to contribute food, but you would like to support this ministry nonetheless, you can also contribute money to helping this meal take place. Also this week on Wednesday evening is our first family dinner for the month of November. Um, that will take place as a drive through or delivery event between 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening. We would like you to please RSVP to Ann Montgomery by tomorrow, Monday, to let her know that you will pick up a meal or that you need a meal delivered. Please uh, check out the bulletin for any more announcements or, or details about that, as well as a menu for what that meal will be. When you do come to the First Family Gathering, please bring with you your yellow sharing and caring cups to support SCCM. Um, we encourage you to fill those up with coins or bills or a check to uh, contribute to SCCM for their fall fundraising campaign. Um, they're doing very important ministry at this time, and we ask you to support that as well. At this time, I'd also like to remind you that we are going to be doing um, communion as part, the Lord's Supper, as part of our worship service today. Uh, I invite you to take a moment as we prepare to worship to gather together your communion elements, whether you've had them delivered or whether you're providing your own. Um, locate those communion elements so that you can have them on hand when we get to that moment in the worship service. Now let us prepare to worship the Lord our God. Please join me for the call to worship. The Lord gathers us from east and west, from north and south. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, who is good. Those hungry for hope, those whose souls are parched, the Lord leads to fountains of grace. God's faithful love endures forever. Come, draw near and hear the words of the Lord. We come with gratitude and praise. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you have knit together your people in one communion and fellowship in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Amen.
Friends, if we say that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins to God and to one another, God, who is merciful, will forgive. So let us confess our sins. First in silence, let us pray. Let us also unite our voices confessing together. Lord, you tell us that the kingdom belongs to the hopeless and that those who mourn are honorable. But we often disregard those among us who are poor and poor in spirit, rather than surrounding them with our care. Forgive us when we shy away from those who yearn for compassion. Forgive us when we rush past those searching for hope because we don't have the right words to say. Lord, break open our hardened hearts. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. By God's grace and by God's grace alone, we are forgiven. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite our children to pay particular attention as we receive a message from Barbara McManus. Good morning. I have a friend with me today. This is our little pup, Hootie. We have another dog. Her name is Birdie, but she's out on the porch and she didn't want to be part of this, so we're letting her alone. Do you have a pet? If you do, I bet you love your pets just as much as I love mine. It takes a lot to take care of your pet, doesn't it? Doesn't matter if it's a dog or a cat or a frog or whatever. It takes a lot. It takes love to take care of them. Here are some of the things that we have to take care of both Hootie and Birdie. Um, we have their dog bowls. We have their dog food. Bertie, are you going to play? Come on up. We have, put that there. we have their dog beds so that they have a place where they can sleep, where they are safe, you know that's where they belong. Um, we take them on a walk and in order to keep them safe when they're on their walk, we have their harness and their leash because we don't want them getting in trouble or running out in front of a car. No, we don't want that. In fact, for Hootie and Birdie, we even have their medicine. It's down here in this basket, but, oh, here it is. We even have their medicine. They take it once a month. It keeps them healthy. They have their toys that they like to play with and run around the house and um, play catch with their toys. Here you go. Ready? Go. Go get it. Um, and then last but certainly not least, almost every day they get some sort of little treat thing and that is their very, very favorite part of the day. So, occasionally we go out of town and the dogs can't go with us. And so we have to ask a neighbor or a friend to take care of the dogs for us. Well, certainly we want them to have all of the things that they have at home. So we take the whole basket, the beds, the treats, and we go step by step with the neighbor as to how our dogs live at our house because we want them to be as happy and as healthy while we're away. Well, 
when I was reading today's scripture, it made me think about how I feel when I leave my dogs behind. Jesus knows that he is leaving and he won't be around to take care of his followers. And he asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Well, Peter says, of course I love you, Lord. And Jesus replies, then feed my sheep. Well, I don't think Jesus is talking about the kinds of sheep that go by, by out in the pasture. I think Jesus is telling Peter to take care of the followers of Jesus once he's no longer around in an earthly form. I think that he asked that of us too. Of all of the followers of him, he asked us to feed his sheep, which indeed means be kind to one another, make sure that you're taken care of, um, show dignity and respect to one another. So I think we have that same um, challenge that Peter had is to go out and if we love God, if we love Jesus, and he asks us to feed his sheep, to treat one another well. And it helps me remember that when I realize how much my pets depend on me, that I need to be as kind to those people around me as I am to them. Can we have a little prayer? Dear God, thank you for our pets. Thank you for Peter and his willingness to say, yes, Lord, I will feed your sheep. Be with us and teach us daily how we are supposed to take care of one another and just like Peter, feed your sheep. Amen. Let us pray. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of John. This is the, almost the very end of John's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. When Jesus and his disciples had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After this, Jesus said to him, follow me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Throughout the fall, we have been exploring the phrase onward with faith and hope. This is a phrase that was created by our stewardship a few months ago. We have explored different aspects of this phrase. Faith, the gift we have received that allows us to trust in God. Hope, a trust that God's future is our future. Even the word onward, 
the direction the church is called to move, dragging the world along with us. These words give us a solid grounding as followers of Christ. Something has been intriguing me as I've been preaching through this series. I've had this thought at the back of my mind that there is something that connects all of these concepts, all of these pieces of a puzzle. I couldn't put my finger on it until two things happened. First, I heard an interview with Bishop Michael Curry. Curry is the presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church. He's originally from Eastern North Carolina, and he has the distinction of being the first African-American presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. He is witty and wise and hilarious. I love every interview I've heard of his, and he recently wrote a book called Love is the Way, Holding on to Hope in Troubled Times. Holding on to hope in troubling times. I'm just beginning to read this book, and it has already deeply inspired me. The second thing that helped me see the connecting points was this. I read the passage for today, this passage from John. Now Jesus in this passage, and in typical Jesus fashion, sort of smacks me up the head with the thing that connects all of the pieces. One word shows up over and over again in our text for today love. That is the connecting piece. And this is how they connect. Love is the root of faith and hope, and love is the tool we use to move onward. Love is the root of faith and hope, and love is the tool we use to move onward. Love is the source of faith. Faith, the trust that we have, the instinct that we have to believe in God, comes to us as a gift, and that gift is rooted in love. It is rooted in God's love for us. Because faith is rooted in love, love is that which we cling to when things are difficult, when things get hard. Because it is when things get hard, it is when chaos looms, it is when pandemic rises, it is when racism overwhelms, that faith is tested and it becomes essential. It is in these times when faith matters most that we discover it is rooted in love. Because God's love is what gives us faith, and only God's love can sustain that faith when we are barely able to survive the chaos and death and fear of this world. Bishop Curry points to a song by Gloria Gaynor. Maybe it's a song some of you will recognize. He uses this song to reinforce that truth. Gaynor sings about romantic love in her song, but the deep truth of her words is the same for the love that we discuss today. Gaynor writes, Gaynor sings, I will survive. Oh, as long as I know how to love, I know I'll stay alive. I've got all my life to live. I've got all my love to give. And I'll survive. I will survive. Her words are true for we who place our faith in God. As long as we know how to love, as long as we have God's love, as long as we have that original gift of love that has been given to us by God that is shown in faith, we know we will get by. In the same way, love is also the source of hope. Love is the source of hope because love is hope's language. Love is how we talk about hope. Curry tells a story in his book about seeing Desmond Tutu speak. This was while South Africa was still in the grip of apartheid and while Mandela was still imprisoned. Tutu closed his speech with these words. I believe that one day South Africa will be free. I believe it not because I can see it, but because I believe that God has a dream for South Africa. This is the God who raised Jesus from the dead. I believe that God has a dream for South Africa because nothing can stop God. Desmond Tutu expressed a deep and abiding hope or dream in God's future. 
This is the same dream, the same hope, the same future in which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. placed his hopes. The dream of a better future that he spoke about in Washington, D.C. A hope for a reality that did not yet exist, that is far from existing, but which reflects God's love for creation. A future that will one day become a better reality for all people. But the belief that the world can be remade to look more like what God hoped for, for creation. More like what God's love displayed and gave to creation. Love may be the source of hope and faith. That may be true. But hope and faith achieve nothing on their own. If hope and faith are simply embraced and held by people of faith, they are valuable but they make no difference. They create no change. Faith and hope can only become change with our actions. You may remember the story right before our passage this morning. Peter and the other disciples return to Galilee after Jesus' death and resurrection. They're back out on the water fishing when Jesus appears to them on the shore. Under his guidance, the disciples catch the fish that they had been unable to catch before. Jesus invites them ashore, and he shares a meal with them. And then they have this conversation. Jesus asks Peter three times, Do you love me? Each time, Peter responds, Yes, Lord, you know that I do. And each time, Jesus replies with some version of, Care for my sheep. Jesus tells Peter, if you claim to love me, if that is where you stand, if you choose to follow me, do so with action. Do so by tending to my sheep, by feeding my sheep, by loving one another. This is Jesus' direct call. To Peter, yes, but to us as well. You have been loved. You have been given faith. You have been given hope. Now go love the world onward into a better future. In his book, Michael Curry tells of a time that he was interviewed by a journalist. He spent time talking about love, talking about love's role in bringing about the massive cultural and political shift of the civil rights era. The journalist said to Dr. Curry, young adults haven't been around that long. They haven't seen evidence of the effectiveness of love in reshaping the broader social landscape. They want to know, can this really work? Can love really work? Curry thought about it a bit. He'd heard the question many times, but almost always in a pastoral setting, never in a secular setting. He had never been asked if love was an effective tool for change in the world, for helping the world move onward. Curry thought through history, about all the times the world has made a positive shift. He thought about Gandhi dismantling the caste system in India. He thought about the alliance of the NAACP and parents who put an end to separate but equal. He thought about the fall of apartheid in South Africa and Mandela and Tutu and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. After thinking through all of these things, he answered, Not only will love work, it's the only thing that will work. It's not only will love work, it is the only thing that will work. Friends, in case you haven't noticed, our country ends an election season this week on Tuesday. This would be an easy time for us to abandon love. It would be an easy time for us to set aside hope and faith for the sake of despair, for us to forsake the truth of the transformative power of love. It would be easy for us to give in to apathy or anger or, yes, hate. We, collectively, all of us, have shown our capacity for division and conflict. If we are honest with ourselves, we know that to be true. 
We live in a world that seems to revolve around selfishness, indifference, and even hatred. But the truth that we know, the truth that we know, the truth that Christians bring to the world is this. Hate destroys, but love builds up. Love is the only way because love is what makes newness possible. Love is what makes growth possible. Love is what builds up. As Martin, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Today we celebrate Consecration Sunday. We commit ourselves to the work of Jesus Christ in the world. We commit our money, our time, our resources to the work of this particular expression of the body of Christ. We promise to dedicate our energy, our intelligence, our imagination, and yes, our love to the building up of the kingdom of heaven. Now there's a practical function to this day. After receiving the pledges that you have returned or that you will soon return from members of our church, your session is responsible for putting together a budget for the year 2021. They make plans and predictions for how we will continue to do ministry with the resources that God has given you and which you have entrusted to the church. This is how we do the practical things. This is how we practically live out Christ's call to love. And there's also the less practical, the less tangible function of this day. While it is a day of specific commitment, it is also a day of broader commitment. We commit ourselves to love. We commit ourselves to spreading God's love. We commit ourselves to building up the kingdom of heaven with love. But it ain't easy. You know it, I know it. It ain't easy. Love is never as easy as it sounds. And seasons like this one show us why. When loving our neighbor becomes difficult, when the disagreement is heated, when the ballots have been counted and the other side won, when we're angry or we're tired or we're confused or we're just over it, Love is really hard. But as hard as love is, is, that is as important as it is. Love is really, really important. Curry writes in his book, the way of love will show us the right thing to do every single time. It is a moral, moral and spiritual grounding and a place of rest amid the chaos that is often part of life. It's how we stay decent in indecent times. Loving is not always easy, but like with muscles, we get stronger both with repetition and as the burden gets heavier, and it works. Friends, Jesus calls us to tend his sheep. Love is how we do this. Love that gives rise to faith and hope Love that is our path and our action onward into God's future. Love helps us to be decent in indecent times. Love gets stronger as we practice it and as the burdens of hate and chaos and fear get heavier. So let us be followers of Jesus Christ. Let us love. Amen. Friends, we have heard the word read and proclaimed. Let us join now in the affirmation of faith. The risen Christ is the Savior of all people. Those joined to him by faith are set right with God and commissioned to serve as God's reconciling community. Christ is head of this community, the church, which began with the apostles and continues through all generations. Amen. Today we take time to recognize the saints that make up the great cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before us in faith and shown us what the journey of faith looks like. Please join me in the litany. 
in the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember them. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. In the opening of the buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember them. When we have joys we yearn to share, we remember them. So long as we live, they too shall live, for they are now part of us. Let us pray. God of the ages, we praise you for all your servants who have done justice, loved mercy, and walked humbly with their God. For apostles and martyrs and saints of every time and place who in life and death have witnessed to your truth, we praise you, O God. For all your servants who have faithfully served you, witnessed bravely, and died in faith, who are still shining lights in the world, we praise you, O God. For those no longer remembered, who earnestly sought you in darkness, who held fast their faith in trial and served others, we praise you, O God. For those we have known and loved, who by their faithful obedience and steadfast hope have shown the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, we praise you, O God. We name before you now, Lord, the saints of this particular congregation, 
who, having run their race in faith, now dwell with you in time and place eternal. Cam Rogers. Carolyn Sharp. Frank Green. Linda Richards. Lord, may we fondly remember their lives, may we joyfully celebrate their faith, and may we eagerly anticipate the day on which we are reunited with them and all of the great cloud of witnesses. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Amen.
We have truly received blessing upon blessing, joy upon joy, and calling upon calling. Let us respond to these gifts and these challenges by fulfilling our commitment as the body of Christ. Let us make our offerings to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, receive the gifts we offer. Use them to bring about hope in a world struggling with despair. Use them to renew faith in the midst of fear. Use them to empower us for the work of love. In your most holy name we pray, amen. They shall come from north and south, they shall come from east and west to sit at table in the kingdom of heaven. According to the Gospel of Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he invites all who would like to trust him more to gather at this table. He invites you whoever you are, wherever you are, to gather at this table. Whether we are confident in the strength of our faith or whether we feel like we're drowning in the questions that circle around us, we are invited to gather at this table. So come, come and join in this feast which Christ has prepared. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup. May the bread we break and the cup we bless be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, offered for the sake of the world. Send us out from this place, nourished by the Holy Spirit, to be about your work. In your holy name we pray, Lord. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, Christ took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the saving life, death, and resurrection of our risen Lord until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God. Truly, they are for us, the people of God. Let us celebrate the Lord's Supper together.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we offer you thanks for the gift of this meal. We thank you for your spirit at work in our lives, nourishing us at this table and sending us out to be your light in the world. May we fulfill your calling to be the love that the world needs so desperately. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, my charge to you is this. May you embrace hope and faith by loving the Lord Jesus Christ and tending to his sheep. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us and all people now and forever. Amen.